I'm Jennifer Asselstein, the undergraduate director for the School of Architecture here at the Academy of Art University. And before Mimi Sullivan, our executive director, um, introduces our guest lecturers tonight, I want to uh, just take a moment to celebrate a couple of things. Um, Flat Architects is partnering with the School of Architecture tonight to sponsor this event. The firm, through the efforts of faculty Philip Ra and Minnie Chu, has provided financial support for the Ethics and Leadership Panel as it ties into their own commitment to broadening their professional and creative community through events that celebrate the diversity of design thinking. Three recent School of Architecture BARC alumni who are now working at FLAD are here to briefly acknowledge the confluence of their education and the theme of design advocacy, which we'll be discussing tonight. I'm thrilled to introduce Jose Malara, Corey Skillman, and Niela Grajales. Hello. Uh, tonight we are representing both Flat Architects and the AAU School of Architecture as alumni from the undergraduate program, as Jennifer has said. As former students, now emerging professionals, the architecture program and and the university as a whole has. I'll say this. Uh, so the university as a whole has helped us become, help us develop a foundation to challenge ourselves to become better communicators of good design. And the program itself has helped us establish a diverse, a diverse set of design methodologies to, to challenge ourselves to evaluate, to critique our work, and to apply those in the field. And now as now, as emerging professionals, we're realizing that we are now using those design skill sets, applying them in the field, and it's also helped us to express our artistic side. And I will pass it on to Corey. So a little about Flat Architects. Uh, Flat Architects, then Flat and Associates, was founded by John Flad, uh, who was a former apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright in the 1930s. Um, they first started um, designing churches and residential buildings uh, all throughout Madison, Wisconsin. Um, the firm expanded to a regional practice in the 1950s and 60s and began specializing in healthcare and higher education projects all throughout the Midwest. In the last 20 years, um, Vlad Architects has started multiple regional offices, including one in San Francisco, where uh, science and technology based projects are developed for clients ranging from higher education, workplace, and life sciences. At FLAD, my colleagues and I look for ways to contribute to the impact of design through learning new and innovative workflows that are fortunately being implemented in our office. And as alumni, we implement our foundational knowledge and skill set that we developed here at the academy to present our design intent to our teams, colleagues, and clients. Now that we have experience, uh, now that we have experience on real life projects, we are starting to see and understand other factors involved in design, such as um, budget, clients, um, end users, and the community surrounding it. Every design intent that we as designers make have an impact on those factors. And it is our role to find ways in which to balance and make decisions that would create good design. Thank you, Jose, Corey, and Yella. That was great. Welcome back. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Mimi Sullivan. I'm the executive director of the Academy of Art School of Architecture. And I want to welcome you all to this evening's ethics and leadership panel. Um, we are privileged to have two very distinguished guests this evening. Uh, the co-founders, co and I have to read the number because I'm going to mix it up. Yeah. Uh, the co-founders of an architectural practice known as 5468796 Architecture. Um, they are Yo Johanna Herme, Herme, excuse me, and Sasha Radulovic. Did I say that right? Okay, great. 
Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of them. Um, forgive me for reading, but these uh, the accolades are too long to try and remember. So, and I want to, yeah, I want to I want to get them all in. So I'm going to start with Johanna, uh, one of the co-founders. Uh, originally from Finland, she immigrated to Canada in 1996, where she obtained her Bachelor of Environmental Design degree and Master of Architecture degree from the University of Manitoba Faculty of Architecture. Working around a single table, the firm has achieved national and international recognition, and its work has been published in over 150 books and publication. publications. Sorry. Uh, Johanna brings an editorial eye to all of the firm's work and is an intuitive thinker, of, often set, setting the conceptual tone for their projects. As a project architect, she has spearheaded projects like U-Cube, um, hedge housing, migrating landscapes that represented Canada at the 13th Architectural Biennale in Venice. In her self-created role as, quote, architect as community leader, which I'm sure we're gonna hear a little bit more about this evening, she has conceived projects such as Table for 12 that grew in 2014 into a Table for 1200, which brought together 1200 like-minded Winnipeggers, I love that word, Winnipeggers, around a single table to celebrate design and the city in which they live. The following year, she conceived Chair Your Idea, an urban initiative on the scale of the entire city, inviting and involving residents from school children to seniors to consider and influence urban design ideas. Uh, Johanna makes design advocacy an ongoing pursuit through university professorships, participation in a number of boards and committees, and through numerous public engagements. She's a past member of Manitoba Association of Architects Council, where for the last two years, she has spearheaded the initiative for a province-wide quality and not fee-based procurement of architectural services. She's also the immediate past chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Com Commerce, leading with a proposal for a, quote, design-driven economy, starting with the establishment of the Design Quarter Winnipeg, a curated design experience focused on authentic, local, retail, and culture. And that's just half of the firm, founders. Sasha, no, not really. <laughs> Sasha immigrated to Canada from Yugoslavia in the mid-1990s after graduating from the University of Manitoba with a Master of Architecture. He worked with Kohlmeyer Architects Limited. In 2007, he co-founded 5468796. See if you can remember that. Architecture along with Johanna. The firm unites the diverse knowledge and experience of 20 young professionals working around the same table. Uh, and we want to hear more about that, too, of course. Um, they make design advocacy an ongoing pursuit through their critical practice, their professorships at universities of Manitoba, Toronto, Montreal, and they've just been appointed the Morgan Stern Chairs at the IIT in Chicago, as well as numerous public engagements. The firm's recent awards include a Governor's General Medal in Architecture, Architectural Review Emerging Architecture Awards, Progressive Architecture Awards, an Architectural Review Future Projects Award, enough already, right? Royal Architectural Institute of Canada Awards of Excellence. The firm's work has also been published, as I mentioned, in over 150 books and publications. And they've received the Canadian Architect Design, excuse me, Canadian Architect Awards for Design Excellence for three consecutive years. <sighs> okay, so. That's why I needed to tell you all this, because it's pretty darn amazing, and they're here with us tonight, and we're so excited to hear from them. So please help me welcome Johanna and Sasha. Thank you for that introduction. It's, it's so hard to listen to that, actually. I know. Painful, it's, it's painful. And thanks for Flat for, uh, I guess, sponsoring this, right? Thank you, and for inviting us, of course. Is there any way that the lights... Go down You'll see a bit. better. It's in your interest. We've seen these pictures before. Yeah. Um, oops. Oh, sorry. I have to figure out where to keep the mic. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for coming and having us and, and inviting us, and Flat again for, for sponsoring uh, means so much to us. Um, so this fall, I guess, we've, uh, we've been in practice for 11 years, and 
it gave us sort of a chance for an article that we were writing to reflect on what our work is about. And um, before I get into all of that, uh, just sort of briefly tell you um, maybe I guess how we got to. Yes, I have 45 minutes. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Um, I'll get to that later. Okay. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to the. So anyway, so um, we've been. We've been working in Winnipeg, uh, as you heard, sort of we came to the city without knowing where we're headed and we didn't really choose it, it sort of chose us. I was a high school exchange student, Sasha was a war refugee, and so found ourselves in the architecture school there and started working together. Um, but when we first started the firm, um, we sort of decided that instead of us trying to talk about what, we, what is it that we wanna do, that it was more important for us just to get to work. And uh, so there's no sort of, we didn't start from a theoretical perspective. I know some firms do, and it certainly wasn't the case for us. Um, You're so, selling that, but sure. What do you mean? Well, we sort of knew what we were trying to do, but that's fine. We'll get He's to that. trying to do something different, but okay. that's not a theory. No, fair enough. Okay. So um, Winnipeg is sort of a, an interesting city in a way that it's a Midwestern city, has all the issues that mi Midwestern cities have across the Americas. And um, has no similarities to San Francisco. Has no similarities to uh, Vancouver, which is the Winnipeg West here, and Winnipeg East, Engl London, England, uh, which is where mo most of our fellow graduates ended up when we stayed in Winnipeg, and there was more of them actually, so everybody left. Uh, Winnipeg was sort of a hinterland of architecture and not somewhere where you wanted to stick around in the cool city like San Francisco um, when you thought about your career as an architect. But, um, and then Since sort of moved this- once, uh, we both sort of decided, made a call to stay, and it was probably one of the best things uh, not to stay in Winnipeg generally, but to, to commit that happened to us, so we were actually committing to this. Now, before you think this is our work, it's not. Um, but this is sort of, this is the stuff that was out there. And I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put this down, but it was sort of like people very, very ambivalent about architecture generally, uh, just didn't care about it. We had to always sort of justify why we were there. It was always like when they, when people heard that you're not from that city, it was always like, why are you here? And, um, but, I think that the context is actually really key to who we are today. Um, it's thought as so much um, in this business. It's a quick feedback loop, which we'll get, get into. Um, it's sort of like a small territory in which you really are visible, either to fail or succeed in. Um, and it's also a slow growth city. So um, you sort of don't get caught up in, in doing cool things, but everything gets tested um, through cheaper and more conventional alternatives. Um, and so, and then Winnipeg's pretty beige. Um, or, or so it looks like that on the surface, but it actually, uh, due to its isolation, I don't know how much you know about it, the map you removed, right? So it's sort of smack middle of the North America, but our closest city is Minneapolis, which is about eight hours drive. So for us to have an event, we have to create it. If we want to have a ballet, we have to have, make our own ballet, right? If we want to have an opera, we, want to, we need to make one ourselves because the, nobody is going to come and, and visit. And for you to go see a big act, you have to travel at least eight hours uh, by car to get to, to one in Minneapolis. So as such, there's a lot of undercurrent and a lot of angst, if you wish, paired with a slow growth that, that makes, uh, makes Winnipeg really um, powerful in terms of artistry and, and, and artists, and it's a hotbed for, for artists. However, architecture kind of goes up and down, and by the time we started our, our practice, it was sort of one of, the, uh, one of the valleys of architecture in terms of the culture in the city, so no, nobody thought of architecture I'm in terms on. of culture. And the, one of our big um, goals when we started our company, uh, which was the first startup in about 20 years in the city, was to try to elevate architecture and the conversation of culture in Winnipeg, and there's plenty of that happening. So from the conception of the firm, we've been focusing on, on I guess, what many people call the missing middle. So multifamily housing work, uh, starting from refugee housing to women's sort of shelter housing to, you know, all the way up to, uh, through co-ops to um, rentals to condos and high-priced condos. And so we've sort of done all of that, and... I guess from that perspective, it's always easy for us to be critical. So I'll just recognize that 
for, for architecture then that tends to cater to the so-called 1%. Um, because we just sort of landed on, on this multifamily housing and through that, I think have been able to touch many more people than, than the average young practice does. Um, and it's, it's certainly true that, um, in, instead of us sort of shaping it, it, it shaped us, the work shaped us long before we were able to, to do so. Um, I think also it, it's, it's as a background is that we've been working in the private development sector, uh, means that again, everything's tested through numbers. Um, the, the margin is which architecture is allowed to exist in that, um, in that realm is incredibly narrow. Um, and, but I think again, because there's such a need as you, as you know, from your own city, we really have to, as architects, push the envelope and try to give housing in particular the rigor that it deserves. Uh, one of the other things that's governed our work is the concept of the, the shared outdoor space. And I referred to these slides there from back home, um, from Helsinki. And uh, it sort of is, is just where, where life occurs. And to me, um, when I compare that, now this is a place where I first lived in Winnipeg. And when I compare that, that shared outdoor space in between multifamily buildings, um, to, to what I'm, I was accustomed to in Helsinki, it's, it's really telling that that space is devoted to cars and parking and a garbage can. And so it sort of tells about the value that a society places on the shared public space. So that's something that we noticed afterwards, and it was sort of an afterthought, but we noticed that that's built into the way that we think. The other thing that governs our work is the idea that we live in so much more in the, in the Americas than many people do around the world. Um, in the 1950s, we each occupied about 290 square feet per person, and now that number is over 900 square feet. So the most sustainable thing we can do is try to, try to sort of convince people that through good design, perhaps, or better design, they can, they can live smaller. And uh, then last point before we get into the work is that through all of this thinking, we've also sort of really believed that we have to widen the picture or the, the realm in which architecture occurs. And the architect becomes the strategist and the, an architecture becomes a strategy more than it, more than it is just an art of building. Um, it's the pressures of the net to gross floor area ratios, like we have to do better. And through whether it's clarity and robustness, efficiency, sort of the flexible processes and kind of relentlessness that we have to apply to all the work that we have and, and can get um, is apparent. Now, I apologize, the next slide, Sasha, you're there, but really was to say that oh, we've there. worked with all these people, because I, I was doing a lecture last time by myself. And so um, I was just saying, you know, these guys, my partners here, and and the other people, I'm mean, speaking for all of them, blah, blah. Moving on to civic opportunities. Um, so a few years ago, uh, this is a fairly old project now, but we, we won a mini competition to do a public performance stage. Um, are you gonna talk about this? We're no, just gonna know. stand there. I, I, I'm not here actually, right? Based on your previous slide, this is where you want me to yeah, plug yeah. in? Yeah, okay. just sort of quickly. So as Johanna says, so it was it was a stage, it was in our backyard because both of us have condos just above it. And the um, one of the things that we struggled with, it used to be a band shelf, you're going to see on the picture, right on top right, and it always felt empty because there was about 40 performances a year, but when there's no performances, so for 316 days, there was nothing going on. So we wanted to create something that would actually have presence and be an active city uh, player over over the uh, 365 days. So that's where the this idea of wholeness, if you wish, or a cube came from. And so the cube is is a whole, and the uh, and as such as through light. not a whole, but like the a opposite. Pole. Am I saying it wrongly? Whole. W h o l e. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Anyway, so the idea was that that, that through light and through uh, through wholeness. The, uh, we could create an object that is memorable and it can actually open up and, uh, and receive the uh, receive performance within. And so the, uh, in order to achieve that, we sort of experimented a lot as, you, as one does and the, uh, came up with this sort of sausage cut aluminum uh, extrusion that allowed us to, to reflect light from within, so emanate rather than be shown on. So therefore the object became active from within rather than being shown on and that, that was very important for us at the time. And really what it did 
most importantly, it actually generated a conversation because it split the public right down in half, just the way your uh, electoral system like These are does. actual quotes. So I just yes. want to say that there was a Facebook page of the haters of the cube who wanted to tear it down. And uh, we got hate mail. And then there was sort of, on the other hand, there was sort of architectural press that thought it was great. Um, and like, I, I think the biggest takeaway for us and the reason we keep showing this project is the fact that we sort of realized that architecture can start that conversation and, and that we tweaked something that was responding to that ambivalence that we were so concerned about. So for the first time, there was sort of real architectural discussion in our uh, experience in, in Winnipeg. And so we understood that from there on and tried to use it over time. It's, it's sort of grown into a, a loved venue, and it, I think we're up to over 100 events a year, and so it does what it's supposed to do. But that's sort of the, uh, you can see here how it opens. It was very important to us. They open inwards rather than outwards, so the cube is maintained, et cetera, but we're not going to get into that much. We got a quick chance or, or a small chance to do something um, of this sort of public pavilion type uh, in Calgary just recently, and um, it, it has, it was, the project call there was that the city of Calgary was developing its uh, sort of direct lands uh, next to downtown. So East Village is the place called. And this is all of a future neighborhood. Um, most of the stuff is developed now, but it wasn't at the time. So important distinction, we didn't have a client per se. We didn't have an end user. We had an end user, but they weren't there to tell us what to do. So we actually had to define. Yeah, so I think we ourselves. got away with murder, yep. to be honest. But well, it was very interesting because the uh, this project, the project was for a community garden shed. So it was meant to, to, to house some tools and do whatever else it could do. And there was a large firm that was in part of the, uh, that was doing most of the landscaping. They got fired because they, they proposed they the Home Depot. They yeah, they did. No, People just, shed, just right? they said that, you know, some small firm yeah, could do different, yeah. do something so anyway, different. So they gave us that and they gave us $70,000 or $60,000 US to do that, uh, all inclusive of fees, etc. And then we had this fight. Um, so just our process is such that we basically punch each other in the office when we have disagreements about design. But I think it's really important for at least the students to hear that it's not sort of smooth sailing. Um, it's often a collaboration, things don't work out, you hate your partner for whatever they're suggesting. And so we had this massive three-day fight over this bloody project. And um, Sasser was the, of, of the opinion that it had to be like a really attractive project, like a really attractive sort of object. And I was like, no, 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 it has got to have a civic quality, like we need to do something for the city. Me. No, um, you have <laughs> skills. Um, anyway. Um, so, and then Colin, thank God, who's often the mediating factor, came in after this sort of massive fight. And I, like, you were throwing a pen at me at no, that point. No, you actually, I threw pens at you at, before. Anyway, but for this one, you. So he comes in and says, "You guys, actually, like where you are right now is solving both issues. So it, it is sort of an object that it is has a civic quality. But uh, to go back, so we had a very limited budget, as every architect says. But um, in this case, we couldn't spend any money on foundations, so we utilized the the sea can or the container, again, as many architects do, um, decided that, you know, because of the program, we had to house these garden tools. We also said, well, we could house some um, public furniture, so that's the other box. And then the third box is where you can actually uh, pot your um, garden plants. We don't know anything yeah, just about gardening. Yeah, them, yeah. Yeah, uh, in the rain if you need shelter. And so it became three containers, and then it really became about working with the budget, because we had 70 grand, as we said, and then um, cladding the boxes and pulling them as far as they could go with the metal still or the steel still spanning across those boxes. And then how far can the structure span? So it was all this equation of how much steel can we afford? How, how far can the, uh, the boxes spread? And how much uh, civic space do we then therefore get to house? And then we were trying to blur the edges of the container, so the corrugation. Um, the cheapest possible material, which is the uh, you're, you're, Cortan metal you're lab. such a bad day. You're having such a bad day. What do you say? It makes no sense. Yeah, well, it's just not flowing. Well, please. please. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I, I think the uh, <laughs> one of the things that we struggled with was, again, this ubiquitous container shape and appearance and so on. So we've tried to learn from it, and that's where this growing geometry comes out of. And then, the uh, as Johanna's saying, the uh, we basically had the oh, money. Now you're has money to sp had a certain amount of money to spend, so we found the cheapest possible material, which is expended Cortan lath, which is about eighty bucks a sheet, and that's really uh, be between that and solid plate. That's what the uh, 
what is that slide? That's what the, the structure is about. So it creates this shelter within. It's a place that you pass through, but it's a place in which you can stop. And as we've evidenced through the uh, through just observing people there, you can see what the garden gardens garden plots behind look like. So as Johanna says, we did get away with murder. Nobody, if these people were consulted, what what should be built for them as a as a garden shed? It certainly wouldn't be sharp corten object, right? But as we did it, uh, they actually do use it and love it. And so the my theory on that that people generally don't like change, yeah. And so uh, what's interesting is to get into a place before um, before people have specific opinions about it, and then you know objects sort of wear and 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 again I think that would have been the same case had to be um, done the other project the old market square stage right. in a sort of a different context. So but, we got no hate mail for this. Nobody cut themselves that we know as of Nobody's yet. dying. Nobody did, yeah. died. Although on the, on the cube stage, many people have died. But we're not Bled to death. Yes. Um, it's been dubbed the cheese grater as well. Um, so we were recently in Peru. Uh, and the wall section there looks like this. So there's two lines. Actually, it looks like this. There's, um, there's the outside, um, or there's concrete, and then... You know, if you're if you're rich, then there's a sort of a thicker line on one side, which is paint. Um, and then, I guess we're just trying to highlight the fact that then the wall section in Winnipeg has to look like this, and it usually has three, uh, you know, twelve layers of material. And one often wonders, like, what is sort of the truth in architecture? What, like, what is this? You know, how do we make sense of this stuff that we these days through building science and so forth? put on buildings and, and how do we figure out what that wholeness is? And of course the cost. So then the way that you detail a building in a northern climate is quite different. It must be different when it's seismic conditions too for you guys, but um, it's sort of like so much of the effort is spent on simply making a building um, Weather tight. I think for color reference sake, our temperatures go, go from plus 110 Fahrenheit to minus 40. So those are the fluctuations between summer and winter. So the buildings have to perform quite well. And the second thing is that we're um, on a former lake, uh, like glacial lake bottom. So the sediment requires us to put every, even a single family home on piles uh, 30 feet into the ground. And so 35% of our, our cost is in foundation. So again, um, a much of the architecture is, is sort of invisible. And then, um, that results in the fact that we only really get to play with very, that small margin that I was talking about. Uh, it's either stucco, it's, it's um, cementitious board or hardy board, or some type of metal. And that's resulted in, in us trying to sort of then do something with it, find these partnerships where we can use the metal in different ways. Um, we work with a fabricator locally who's from a, a Hutterite colony, so religious colony that they specialize in one thing and the colony does that. So they have these amazing CNC cutters and laser jets and, and yet they don't get to watch TV. Um, and so then oftentimes, um, you know, we're trying to sort of pare things down and the, um, and the structural elements become sort of screens or um, walls or bookshelves, cladding systems. cladding systems. And so no more about that. But I guess when you think about housing, then also the relentlessness of, of window patterns that housing in itself is sort of baked in. One has to try to constantly, um, I think, to, I don't know, challenge ourselves or provide better spaces for, for people, um, have to try to reinvent that formula. Cool. So why did you throw this project in? So you have um, well, it was about the public space. So I, and I won't dwell on this, but one of the older projects where we were trying to experiment with uh, really sort of that stucco that I was talking about, and in this case, a little bit of color and different window sizes that were three different standards. And then we were asked to do a 25-unit uh, uh, building block housing for, in this case, originally started with Muslim refugees. Um, and there's an interesting uh, thing there where they're not allowed to hold loans. You know the story better. Well, uh, Sharia laws, laws do not allow them to uh, pay interest. So the, there is there is a whole there was a whole mechanic, a uh, whole system of financing the project at the time uh, that we went through in order to enable it. But I think the point of this slide is the, the picture above is the is the is basically the houses that uh, 
or what the site used to look like. This is actually happening right across the street. It's one of the busiest uh, traffic streets in Winnipeg. We don't have a we don't have freeways in the city, except for one, which we'll talk about sh shortly. But that was sort of the replacing six six. Um, houses with 25 units for refugee families. Yeah, and I think what's very important is to trying to understand the local economy. So in this case, we know that stick framing, so two by uh, construction, is the cheapest possible way to build in Winnipeg. Um, we have a lot of Polish and Ukrainian immigrants who can hammer, you know, building together, whereas we don't have the Italian and Spaniard uh, heritage that the coast do and can often build out of masonry quite che uh, quite cheaply or, or quite a bit cheaply than we can. And this building was really, oopsie, trying to utilize Dubai tans as the maximum size of a, a structural member. And then also uh, we were really fascinated by the, again, the life outside of the building and even in the northern climate, how much, you know, you could potentially squeeze the interior space to allow for the public um, public life to um, to occur. So that's sort of an uh, original sketch of that. But the project started from the interior and we figure out sort of minimum dimensions trying to challenge the North American standard um, and then cantilevered some of the boxes. These were eight by 12s and then some were 14 by 12s as the extension and then simply varying that around caught some richness out of it. Uh, one failure that we certainly had was because it was for uh, low income families and, and social housing project in the end is that we realized that as we were sort of tightening the dimensions uh, that were more sort of European and in, in, in what we grew up and were used to, Ikea, Ikea, Ikea sized, yeah. that most people who lived here got hand-me-down furniture and it was big, it was massive, it was sort of American sized. And then we're basically like saying like, we, we don't fit here um, through that process. So understanding the context really becomes important. All right. I guess maybe I'll get to say a few things. Eh? So the uh, this was one of the projects where uh, we worked with a developer, inherited the site zoning at 10 units. One of the things that we usually try to do is improve financial performance on projects by adding units through smart design. Here, uh, the uh, we, we inherited that zoning, never wanted to change it, or a client never wanted to change it. And so it was basically zoned for 10 units. It was a block. It was given by... Uh, by zoning and the uh, one of the things that we often look for are configuration of units that allow us cross ventilation which is if you ever done housing you understand that in north america you have two stairwells connected by a by a corridor and then units feed off of that there's no cross ventilation or the system is not even uh, even considered there's no rules that require windows in every room and so on so that's one of the things that we always look for and so the uh, in this particular project when we first started with sort of took our zoning envelope and tried to divide a number of different ways, either as a townhouse or flats. We were never getting to the uh, to, uh, to qualities that we were looking at. And so we broke up the, um, do you mind going back? Please. Uh, we broke up, we decided to uh, to sort of look at the project as, as 30 different blocks um, and then allocated three of those segments, if you wish, to each of one of the units for 10 units that uh, the building gets a name from is block 10 and then we've staggered them throughout the building so we what ended up through this experiment is that we had every unit had double aspect at minimum so it was facing both forward and backwards but also eight out of ten touched the corner in one way or another so you get all this orientation cross ventilation and and actually zero non-sellable space as all the stairs within the building were within the suite themselves so then we imagine all kinds of lives happening within but that was really to illustrate you know, the, uh, the, how the units cascade through the building and how the section works. The other thing that we ended up doing here and experimenting with and sort of with, with, with very levels of success is designing condos that are um, um, as white boxes. So the, the way it was designed, each one of the three modules in every suite could be anything in your, in your living life. So it could be we design in a way that you can plug a washroom or a kitchen on any one of the floors or a bathroom or a kitchen on any one of the floors, therefore permitting all different kinds of configurations. And the um, and lastly, one of the aspects that's always important to us is how the building interfaces with the city. And so the while this is on a fairly uh, prominent traffic route in the city, one of the things that we've tried to do is develop this interstitial space between the screen and the mass of the building that actually gives privacy to one that sits at the uh, sits on the balcony 
because of the oblique view of the slats that you're gonna see on the next slide. But you can actually, if you're in the building, you can see out entirely, it's almost transparent. So the building is really 99% efficient. We were able to, our client was able to sell 99% of the building. 1% was the electrical room on the, uh, on the ground floor. Oh, well, look, you get to keep going. I Let know. Be quick. <laughs> well, we have time now. I've got time. So this, this is a, a remnant. The old pump house is a remnant of, of Winnipeg's heyday, which was happening somewhere between 1885 and 19. 19 and the it was a building that was built right after chicago fire and was supposed to provide um hydrants with sufficient or ample water in order to suppress fire at that time it was actually fortunately never used it ran for about 60 years and it's been abandoned since since the 60s and there's been in last as winnipeg is a slow growth city so these things don't happen very often but in the last 14 years there were 17 different attempts at redevelopment of the building and we've actually participated in one, I think, build one or two um, at the very early it stage. It really doesn't matter. It Moving doesn't. on. But the uh, I, I think what was the attempt, that, what was the problem is uh, we weren't, we or other architects or developers were not able to, to uncover the potential on how to make it actually uh, financially, not necessarily profitable, but, uh, but sustainable. So um, you don't have to click. So the uh, you can sit down and relax. So anyway, so the, 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 we heard uh, through the grapevine through one of our clients that city is going to give it one more shot. City used to own it, so give it one more shot before they're they're intending to de to uh, to demolish it. And we thought, goodness, there's got to be a way to do this. So the uh, what turned out that we've discovered, and maybe you can change it now, is that there is thank the uh, thank you. Next slide, Johanna. The no. That was for the previous slide. Um, so what we discovered, you can see, this is what it looks like inside. So it's basically a sequence of six pumps. One got stolen. So that's a side story uh, by one of the proponents. And the uh, and it got stolen only because there are um, they were able to actually move it out of the building. And they were able to do that because they had these gantry cranes. You can see they were um, installed in order to install the pumps in the first place. And then, of course, as, as means of uh, repairing them or moving large, heavy parts or stealing the pumps. And so... So we've discovered that the, um, the we have 45 minutes, uh, we have 18. So we've discovered that these gantry cranes and the rails that they're, they were sliding on actually had structural capacity, which enabled us to build, build a new floor within the space and maintain the pumps uh, where they were. At the same time, we've identified two uh, potential uh, lots for, um, for additions onto the building. So all that paired together actually made financial sense. And we did this completely on the cold uh, and then uh, created a little financial performa that we've learned from some of the developers that worked in the past and presented it to two of our clients and said, you guys should create a little marriage and try to, uh, try to develop this. We think there is a real potential to do so. So they thought that was the case. Like the previous slide, this is all done on spec, and the previous slide was sort of showing what the potential is. And then we did one rendering, which is this saying, hey, this, this is what space within could look like. And so we took this to the city agency that owned the building, and they actually took about two years to negotiate the price and so on. And the once by the time they were done with all of that, we were able to proceed with the project. We were only after getting a good fee and doing this project ourselves as architects, right? Getting this project. So that was our benefit and obviously saving the building. I think the point here is that uh, <laughs> sometimes you, as an architect, again, going back to that strategist piece, is that you have to also see the opportunities of where to sort of put the right people in the room together so that the opportunities to have a project exist. And sometimes being creative people, we can uh, sees those opportunities beyond just a sort of a formal expression or something that easily falls into the into the purview of an architect. But, but I'm also pausing here because we recently sent this to an award submission, and at the last minute, where I was looking a different direction, Sasha squeezes in this stupid sketch at the top. Uh, you know, like a very Frank Gehry thing to do. Um, and I just hate it because it's exactly the opposite of what we do. We don't do like little concept sketches that, you know, are beautiful form, but it's much more like, okay, where's the land? How much does it cost? Who this can we one, sell it this to? This sketch lived in me for like five years. This is five years of anger. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully you got that out, but it's so dishonest. <laughs> so it drives me crazy. Anyway, continue. 
Okay, so where were we? So the the the, the, the existing building is has been redeveloped to the uh, to the office for advertising agency, about twelve hundred square feet on that suspended floor. The pumps are visible to public and visible by public. And then wherever the pump was stolen, we are putting a restaurant in. We this space is now occupied. Um, why are these slides so poor? Wow. Anyway, so this is what's happening when you're inside. The, uh, the, the pump or industrial floor below remains as you enter. You go up the stairs into this loft or a croft, if you wish. And then this is what the spaces inside look like. Um, with uh, most of the grime of, of 100 years of, of existence of this building, unheated building, was left as it is. We just wiped it off and then introduced new, extremely inexpensive structure. They developed this for about $35 a square foot. Uh, That's Canadian. In its right? entirety. Yeah, Canadian. Um, and so the uh, everything has remained sort of the way we found it, and that was a very important thing. We tried to touch the building rather lightly. We made sure that entrances into both residential blocks that are on either side are actually just squeezing through the existing openings, and they are in the old building. So when you come to come back home at night, you do have to walk through the through the heritage building. The other thing that that was that's proving as a, as a critical tool in trying to increase efficiency in buildings are skip stop skip stop corridors that are not permitted in Canada, but we've developed alternative solutions to allow for that. Which is basically a corridor serves units at that level and the units above through a through a simple stair within the unit. So these these drawings are actually not projecting for some reason very well, but the. Uh, that's basically two suites that are accessed off a, off a single corridor. The other thing that it does, aside from uh, reducing the amount of building you're building, it also allows for cross ventilation because the units uh, do not open onto the, on the corridor in the middle. I also have to comment on these renderings again that were done for other architects so that you know there's a difference. Um, it's the building is 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 going to have a vibrant ground floor. It's going to have people around it. Um, but there's oftentimes like a different way that we sell and we're salespeople, uh, ultimately as architects, uh, all of us are, um, we're selling it to a different audience. So just so you know that it, it looks pretty repellent, um, <laughs> these images. Repelling, you think, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and then the, so there was a, there was a, something to say about those renderings actually that was meaningful, but anyway, the, uh, so here <laughs> where we were trying to, to capitalize on the view towards the river. Again, single single sided corridors being skipped up have reduced the no amount of corridors on the uh, on the single aspect building, and this is sort of the the space under the building in Winnipeg winter with suspended benches and is that Kanye West or whoever that is? No, it is it's the Bond guy. Done. Okay. Did All right. Um, oh, I'll take a break. So I guess. <laughs> Yeah, going back to what we're then trying to do to get people to get excited about design, it goes well beyond, like, uh, I think especially in cities where um, people could care less about what is it that architects do or what design potential has, I think we have to wake that in people. And um, my comparison is often the fact that, again, I, I grew up in a culture that has an architect on the money. Like a picture instead of a president, there's a picture of, um, or there was a picture when I was little, um, of Alvar Alto. And so again, like the the way that we place value on on design was quite different from where I grew up and and what it was in Winnipeg. And and throughout our career, we've been trying to do these what Sasha calls them the lose your shirt projects, because I'm often no. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't pay and we do them voluntarily and whether it's you know warming huts or um skating huts on the on the river or um or envisioning a, a, a night of crits at the architectural offices on a monthly basis so that we can raise the bar of of the production that happens in professional offices or urban golf and fringe festivals to um to teaching, to participating in competitions, uh, or or expanding the Venice Biennale project again, that we were lucky enough to receive a commission to do to nine cities as opposed to just going to Venice to so try to develop a new financial model for it. We're we're trying to sort of chip away at the what the role of the architect and test different ground or where he, where we can be effective or um, make a difference. Um, in 2013, I think it was mentioned in the intro, we um, we were lucky enough to uh, receive the Prix de Rome for Architecture for Canada, which is a $50,000 uh, fund uh, for a project. And we proposed actually to have dinner in eight different cities and drink wine with a bunch of 
people to try to discover what architecture culture is, who creates it, how it's perpetuated, how is it maintained. Um, and I know it sounds hokey, but it actually was really valuable because you get people in that social situation and supposed to an interview, and we had developers, media people, um, other architects, um, um, engineers, city policy makers, and so forth at these dinners, and then brought the lessons back home so that we could be even more effective in this pursuit in the future. And then, of course, that spawned that table for 1200, then, which is now, um, we handed it over to our partner, the advocacy organization in, in Winnipeg, Architecture Advocacy Organization, after the first year's success, and they're now running it as a, an, an annual um, fundraiser for their organization. So 1,200 people come together and eat dinner in a sort of secret location that gets announced on the day of, and they bring their own chairs and so forth. Um, so that's become a big thing, and, and you know, mayor participated, we had the Minister of Culture there, and all of a sudden you're having sort of these conversations with people who make decisions and have power. Um, similarly, uh, our mayor, Brian Bowman, became the sort of um, the poster boy for our Cherry Your Idea project that asked people what to what they would do with $35,000, and then we used the money uh, from the participation fee to to actually build the winning project. Uh, Design Quarter was also mentioned. This is another effort through the, um, through, uh, um, well, actually a member-based organization that started with, inspired by the design district in Helsinki that's trying to bring the local creatives, um, and again, it's very retail-based, so um, uh, it's local retailers, artisans, and so forth that produce unique things in our city. Um, uh, to bring them all together and benefit from uh, marketing, uh, collective marketing and the power of the collective. And so we placed them. Um, Just use the time. Yep. Uh, we placed a uh, two kilometer walkable circle on top of Winnipeg. This was the Helsinki one. And yeah, so to discover that, um, yeah, discover that there is already about 60 businesses that would qualify. And again, developed a uh, business model for it, went on knocking on some doors and to get the startup money together and so forth. And now it's been written about in travel magazines and Lonely Planet and Australia through um, Germany and has produced, from what I heard from Tourism Winnipeg, $340,000 worth of you know tourism advertising or something like that. Anyway. Um, but I do think that what's important for, I think, students, and we try to preach about it this almost, is to get involved in so many different areas. Like we, we can't be in our own bubble. If we want to have an impact on the world, we have to get into the politics. We have to get into the business world. We have to find uh, the trail of uh, decision makers and the money and sort of follow it and, and, and make sure that we get the opportunities to make a difference in the world anyway. So this is my... Um, chamber um, effort, um, try to sort of argue, and now I'm tweeting these things out uh, for density in our city that's sadly lacking of it. We're one of the least dense cities in the world, and people believe still very much so that we're running out of land and that we should sprawl. And when you look at what the cost of sprawl is, it's ridiculous. We have $7 billion infrastructure deficit in our city, and to try to convince people that we should grow inwards as opposed to outwards is a real battle. Um, and so I've been doing these info sessions at the, at the chamber events on a monthly basis through my chairmanship year there um, and um, continue to try to do something with it. Um, this year sort of culminated in um, us producing a policy document through the chamber that talked about the values uh, that we should be implementing in the city and while we grow the city. Sorry, it's a bit boring, but love stats. Stats work. So I think one of the things that Johanna is is uh, sort of not mentioning through this in a city of Winnipeg size, which is about seven hundred fifty thousand people, uh, we are getting uh, instant feedback on our projects, uh, whether it's through social media. But they they do tend to make an impact, whether it's good or bad, and people get to learn that, right? When you build in cities like Toronto or San Francisco or design within a city, your impact is so limited because of the, just the sheer scale. So one of the, one of the things that um, 
that uh, call them second or third cities um, do you have for us as architects is that 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 um, ability to test our ideas and actually learn from them rather quickly as opposed to being swallowed within the market this is a project that's really um, really odd and it took about eight years to complete it's still not complete but to get to the pictures i guess it's it's on a very peripheral site you can see it's here it's backing onto a number of um, industrial properties and the uh, the key for the project was the uh, to understand how it could actually exist within uh, on a site that had no frontage so there was no guaranteed space to which we could put windows and make sure we can actually look over something so the uh, one of the uh, you, you removed some slides here anyway so so one of the things uh, so it's surrounded either by backs of the buildings or a highway the only highway elevated highway that we have in, in the city so early on in the project we told our client the only thing you can do if you want to turn this into condos or into living is you have to lift the building up and so we rented a, a little scissor lift and took him up there and took some pictures and said okay this is what you would be getting if you are able to lift the building about 30 feet and after that the exercise became really on how um, can we make it less expensive because once we've expended all the money to lift the building off the ground in order to make it financially feasible we have to do that and so we basically went through the this wild goose chase and discovered something that should have been obvious from the get-go is that the circle is much more efficient envelope wise much more efficient than a square and we've learned that through designing a circular building or if we were to design a circular building we would be able to reduce envelope by about 30% for an identical amount of volume within. Also, the non-rentable or sellable uh, corridor space is actually shorter as well. Yeah. So the uh, the building ended up being called 62M, M standing for the street that is be closed to put the project on, called McDonald. And the uh, ended up being this disc suspended suspended in the air. Uh, the To get us to a successful project, you really need three things to work out. You have to have a client that's willing to uh, go with your... Uh, with your thoughts and ideas, and you have to have a contractor. Of course, you have ideas, but you have to have a contractor who's willing to build it. So we've we've sort of shopped this project for a little while with our client, and it sort of arrived at, at this prefabricator who was able to do concrete as well. So the project is really um, a puzzle of pieces that that are put together through means that this contractor was had access to. So they do basements and concrete. So we did the really raw concrete core that was actually we were not shooting for architectural concrete or anything like that uh, he was able to precast the columns same way you would cast uh, grade beams brought him to the site put some uh, steel beams on top of that and then the beauty of keeping the building relatively low was that actually we could finish the rest as in as with timber using wood and so therefore keeping the costs rather um, rather low. So kind of if you want to speed up, we can speed up. So the columns are sort of trying to, to, to navigate this geometrical puzzle between radial and round geometries and the uh, orthogonal geometries. Uh, these units were prefabricated or the walls were prefabricated and brought to site. The building went up rather quickly. As you can see here in pieces, portions of the pie brought in and, uh, and elevated and constructed. And the, we started this design in 2010, priced it in 2014, talking about slow growth city, started building in 2015 and still not quite finished. The circles are tricky when you don't have money. Um, so the uh, the building is actually faceted and it was one of the biggest things that we were worrying about is how is this faceted circle sort of half executed concept, half ass executed concept. And so the um, that's where the, uh, the system of fence surrounding the building came from uh, that actually camouflage the fact that the glass is, is faceted. So they play with the reflections um, take your eye away from the actual faceted geometry and then through uh, relatively simple means of cladding we were able to achieve what we, what we think is the uh, circular geometry here. Again, uh, the uh, the building was, um, you wouldn't know this, but about in 2015, so after it was tendered, Canadian dollar just plummeted compared to the American dollar and we had to change the entire cladding system because we couldn't afford the materials that we were, we were able to afford a year but prior to that because Canadian dollar was much stronger. So it taught us a lot about actually paring down our designs beyond what the budget actually requires. And the, we think the building is, you know, initially it had to have, it was supposed to have the shiny, uh, shiny exterior, reflective exterior, end up being finished in Cortan, which hides oil canning quite well. So you can use it in a rather, rather uh, thin, uh, thin material. And then instead of doing a fancy skin, we did a chain link, chain link, uh, mesh um, that sort of envelops the, the corridors inside. The um, 
so as we said, the building is supported by the concrete columns in the concrete corner in the middle that has stairs and the elevator, and then the uh, two layers of, uh, of condos on either side. There's 20 condos in each one of those. And the, uh, the shape of the units, again, something we've discovered through, the, uh, through this exercise, was quite conducive to living because where we needed most light on the perimeter where the living and bedrooms are, that's where we have the access to windows. And then the, the, the square footage of units shrinks towards the back where you need less space. Storage is always a question, but this permitted us to actually create rudder efficient units with only 2.3 meters or seven feet of corridor space allocated for every unit. If you think about corridor buildings, that's quite little. And then uh, 21 feet on the perimeter for glass. And the units are sort of the uh, bachelor shaped uh, or bachelor, uh, bachelor size with two different configurations. The first one uh, and the second one, which is more of a Swiss pocket knife strategy, which has one single uh, wall of uh, that houses the bathroom, storage, kitchen, etc. Sorry, I'm only uh, not interrupting because I want you to I suspect go that faster. That was, that was the case. <laughs> yeah, so the uh, this is the building and it's uh, sort of last winter and the um, sort of lurking through one of our other projects. And these, are, these pictures are as finally we got an asphalt for the parking lot right underneath it this year. And hopefully we're going to get it all finished and see see it finished next year. There's a little story on the top of it and, and we were trying to save, partially try to save the developer some money and partially get paid for the work that we do, which is also sometimes a problem, um, as you might be able to imagine in the professional life. And so we sold the developer the idea that we would take his rooftop on top of his elevator core and the stairs uh, in lieu of um, some of the fees. And we ended up building this little glass box on top of it that serves now as sort of a special artist retreat. Uh, so if you come to Winnipeg, let us know. We'll house you. Um, and uh, and then the idea is that, uh, you know, these artists who stay there and get to appreciate the city from a different perspective and leave little objects behind so that we have a story to tell eventually. I w we won't talk about this next project. Um, I want to uh, end on something more intriguing, I'm sorry we put it here. It's attainable housing for a competition in Arkansas that we just uh, finished and we're um, among the uh, winners for various five different sites. Um, it talks about sort of the public space and the nature of how you build cheaply or understand the local economy, we think. What are we gonna talk about, Johanna? What do you mean? You're jumping to that, what else? Okay. Oh, I just wanted to end here. So uh, a place where we we felt that we sort of made the biggest real difference so far, and again, it's one of these Sasha's Lose Your Shirt projects, but um, we had some uh, architecture friends in, in Mexico City, and together with them proposed the pavilion uh, for the Mextropoli, um Architecture Festival that runs every March. And um, it was based on the uh, interesting economy of the Vienna Vienne, which are local entrepreneurs, uh, so local uh, people who take a, an ordinary painter's bucket and claim public space with it for Fill parking with purposes. Concrete. Fill up with concrete, right? Yeah, so they're heavy buckets. They place them in parks and so on uh, to mark uh, parking stalls and then charge you money if you park there, and if you don't pay, they slash your tires or something happens to your car. And the interesting thing is that this is very lucrative apparently, and the police is sort of in on it. And so it's a whole economy. I can't remember what the numbers it's a are. Billion dollar economy a year. Uh, yeah. Because there's no public parking in Mexico City other than parking. So our idea was to try to reclaim the public space back through the use of the the ordinary uh, bucket. And uh, we were sort of inspired by the fact that the, the bucket has a little bit of a tapered edge. So it has this sort of ability to, to morph and have a, have a bend in it quite naturally. Um, and uh, work through that uh, sort of weaving, I don't know if I have the pictures, I think I do, weaving the buckets together on the back of it and then counterweighting the tip that you see there um, uh, to sort of create a wave shape and so to really uh, speak to the sort of how to elevate that ordinary object to something different. And of course, uh, Mexico City, crazy. Uh, so many people, so many users. The kids were climbing on this thing. At one point, it actually tipped over. And um, Didn't we- Didn't kill anybody. 
thank God. I was so worried. But anyway, uh, so what's interesting about it, then it was up for three days during the festival. And then after that, it sort of got absorbed into the city. We sort of released it and people just took the buckets. And it's interesting to see the economy of how that simple object, even though some of them were even punched with the ropes that we have on the back of it, um, were just sort of taken. And you appreciate the amount of stuff that we as sort of North Americans and Canadians and privileged people generally have. Um, and then, but what became more meaningful is that then we had an opportunity to bring the project back to Winnipeg and we got the crew from Mexico City who we're working with and our partners um, to come build it with us there. Idea being that these empty buckets would come from Mexico City and then we would, after the project was finished at the Winnipeg Design Festival, we would sell each of the buckets for um, 20 bucks and be able to send some goodwill back to an orphanage, girls' orphanage back in Mexico City. And we ended up collecting quite a bundle of money through that and, and sort of felt like we really actually were able to help these girls. But yeah, it was one of these things where everybody in the office was working super, like it looks simple, but it took a lot of effort to, to do. And of course, kids are kids everywhere. And so the way that people used it and ran on it and, and sort of hung out on it um, um, was the same, regardless of the culture. We'll leave it at that. That's the girls. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I don't think we need these. Come on, what happened to symmetry? Great, thank you so much. All of them. Everything you showed was just so interesting and thought provoking. And we have some questions from our fifth year students here. Yeah. And so I'm, they're not necessarily directed to one or either of you or both or whoever wants to. Okay. I'll, I'll. <laughs> no pens. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So, first question is: How do you introduce design ideas when they are not given as part of the brief or, or program that you have? Maybe I'll take this one. <laughs> so, I, one of the reasons we actually ended up, thank you, we ended up starting our our firm was the our old boss. We used to work together for about five years. Starting was. Uh, told us that we're not supposed to discuss ideas with our clients, and especially if those ideas are not just about plain tectonics or how the building's getting built and so on. And uh, we sort of didn't enjoy that comment and, the, um, and, and thought to ourselves that let's start this thing, let's see if it, work, where it works. If it doesn't work and we fail in a year, then we can always, we're quite employable. At, we were quite employable at the time. At the, employable at the time, we are not anymore. Uh, but the... Uh, and so we started discussing concepts with our clients and found out that actually they're interested to hear about what the narrative is behind any any idea, right? And of course, that's that different people have different amount of, of of interest and things like that. But the, we've we've never we've always been rather transparent with the ideas. Often invited clients to to sort of small internal charrettes to talk about projects, sometimes guiding them towards the right idea, sometimes actually completely innocently leading the entire team towards the idea. And the uh, we're never afraid of, of uh, talking about these uh, about our thoughts and, and what we think is the right thing to do and the, uh, you know, often it, it creates a buy-in uh, that you need from a client um, and then if you do stumble upon something together that is uh, much more powerful than sort of feeding a client with an idea so if you're developing something together you're deciding that is the right way of approaching the project then there is you can always call back on it when the Go and get stuff right towards the um, towards the end. And it always does and and it always every does. time. There's no easy projects. No, you're good. You're good. So, as you know, this evening we've chosen design activism as the theme for the discussion tonight. Uh, and so, the question is, how might you define design activism or advocacy in your own practice? Okay, well, I think we define it in all the ways that we've sort of shown you, which is sometimes it's about doing um, actual projects, which in itself is a is a sort of an advocacy piece, even if it's about architecture, if we think we're achieving or, or breaking new ground or something. 
Um, it's also via means of the sort of extracurricular projects that we tend to try to do, but it's, it's, it's every time you're asked for an opinion and you voice it publicly or you try to influence a, a political uh, process, for example, we had this crazy um, public debate about our one of our main inter intersections just um, a month ago. And um, again, I think design people have to talk to these issues that affect us all on an everyday basis much more than I think we do currently. So it sort of, it permeates every aspect, I think, of what we do. And I sort of hope it's almost like a call to action uh, to many of the students to realize that it isn't just about making things pretty or making them function. It's about trying to find the opportunities where those, where those um, projects can exist. Yeah, we perhaps were in somewhat unique situation in, in Winnipeg. As, as we said, like, there was a heyday of architecture when most of our old city was built 100 years ago and another one in modern, modernist times uh, that ended, ended in the early 70s. And then there seems to be a new wave of new ideas and architects uh, doing things. And, and mo while we think of both practice and these extracurricular projects, as Johanna refers to it, as just part of one, part of being a designer today in the world and, and, and sort of being disruptive to, to the, uh, one of the reasons we started our firm was to be disruptive to the local architectural scene and economy, and then we are both loved and hated for that. And the, um, uh, but there is a, there is a definitely new energy. There's been about 20 new startups in the last 11 years, and then there is a, there's a, there's a culture of sharing, which might have to do just with the times that we live in, but it, uh, it, it used to be that architects thought that the, their ideas are, are a privilege and then nobody should, should be sharing those. So we've done a whole bunch of things uh, been part of a whole bunch of things that have happened in the last 11 years that that uh, the I think helped everybody tap into the culture of architecture or started thinking about architecture as part of who we are as cultural beings and so the we, we haven't talked much about it but the the uh, there's an advocacy organization now that we have that advocates for architecture and design um, we um, the events that we have, it used to be that there would be an event once a year that you would go, um, having to do with architecture. Now there's overlapping events. We have a design festival uh, that happens over three days in the fall. We have warming huts that happen in the winter. The uh, There is a fine dining on ice, which is a combination of, of archi innovative architecture and uh, the best one of the best restaurants in the city where they're bringing chefs from all around the world, selling tables you know, 450 or sorry, seats at the table, $450 for a dinner. You know, it's a very unique experience. So okay, the, okay. et cetera, et cetera. So what, sorry. What's the point? I guess the point is <laughs> that the, uh, there is an energy in the city and it's palpable and it's due to a number of, um, number of architects that have taken on the volunteering part of it all. Right. And the, uh, as Nancy Pelosi said, VIPs, volunteers in whatever her, her acronym was but the uh, yesterday but the uh, I think we have to as architects and people who are we know what our value is uh, the we shouldn't be shy about it and we should certainly not assert it in a way that imposes it but certainly assert it in a way that that speaks to how it can actually improve people's lives right so we have a lot of people yeah, that attend think about it like we've seen events. that here today like the the project types that we sort of were exposed to today in your school i thought were amazing that the fact that there's real activism you're trying to make a difference in the world in a sort of a really palpable way i i, I think it's actually very rare and um i was sort of amazed by all of that so thank you for doing what you're doing that's that's great to hear. I thank the students for doing all the hard work too. You mentioned a design advocacy group that's new, new, newish. Is that a city promoted, city sponsored, or is it purely volunteer, grassroots? Uh, it's group? It, it gets a good chunk of its funding from the Manitoba Association of Architects because they are a regulatory body and they can't advocate. And so um, I guess there was um, enough of a sort of a slush fund that they are giving the um, giving the group about sixty thousand dollars a year, and then the rest is through fundraising and different activities. Um, and so, and is the goal to just broaden awareness of uh, in the public for design or for architecture, or what is its what is the ultimate? Is it about urban planning? Is it about a number of things? Real variety of goals, anything from within the profession, because we tended to sort of operate in silos of firms and so on, and now we do share work, 
like Johanna mentioned, we do have this thing called On the Boards. I think we've actually had 100 sessions, and we are not a big, big community, right? There's about, what, 400 architects in the city now? Um, the uh, 100 sessions in which up to actually eight architects shared their projects in early stages, and the others could get to to critique and you will have anything from 10 to 100 people attending these things and the, uh, it really broadened uh, I guess our joint openness to talk to each other and understand what's happening and sometimes it's very important to understand what other architects were thinking when they were doing a project and so we can advocate for that or to learn something from another project and or to learn from another architect in, in a crit session and so on so that that was sort of that's on a grassroots but otherwise it is awareness the warming huts that happened on the river one year because of one of our colleagues actually came up with the idea and we helped, helped implement it uh, are now in their 10th year. Uh, we get about 200, 150 to 200 entries every year that all, from all around the world. And the, but it was from one of the uh, past presidents of our associate, architectural association who said like he would spy on people as they are skating down the river and going, going to these huts. And they're talking about architecture. And he said, this is the value that we as architects need to promote and help exist. So while everybody thought they're going to be a one-year stint, the warming huts now, we're in the 10th year. We have 30 or 40 of them now. Uh, because some of them get get thrown away. Yes, so. but I, I would disagree that that's actually the value. I don't I don't think the end goal is for people to talk about architecture. I think it's for people to realize that design has a real impact on their day to day life. It can make it better. It can make it so much worse. Um, we have what bad design can, or like even just your health, or or the way that you behave in a city, uh, the way that you can. Um, I don't like it. if you have a 45 minute or longer commute, you're 40% more likely to get divorced. Like it, it's, it's crazy stuff that we can, whether it's urban design or whether it's sort of interior design, it, it penetrates everything. And that to me is the fascinating part. Is that the form within which you're able to share that information? Or are there other ways that you can, you're doing that to help the public understand those, those values or those impacts of how architecture can improve? impact your health or I guess do you happiness? have any ideas because you know it's social media it's trying to put these little info bits out there it's to try to engage uh again people who have influence generally like just going after that uh try to provoke conversation through projects that people either hate or love or um or just having conversations right I and mean, we have organizations here in the city um like spur and, you know, they'll put out newsletters and those are the kinds of, sometimes those are the kinds of statistics that will, you know, get shared. But I think social media is probably one of the better, obviously, easier um, avenues to share that. Uh, yeah. accessing, the, uh, accessing the decision maker is the key, right? So every time, Johanna has, has, is very politically savvy and the uh, as, as a crowning, if you wish, achievement of her um, being a, her chair, chairwomanship of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we put together and we worked hard to put together a conference where Jan Gell from Denmark, who is the world's foremost uh, urban planner, if you wish, and, uh, think and thinker, uh, actually responded to our call and came over and spoke to a room of, of uh, 300, 400, 500, 600, yeah, 600. 600 uh, business people. Uh, few architects, of course, but the uh, 600 is business people that do not think about things of, you know, urban design daily. And that's sort of, you have to do that constantly. And Johanna has been doing the, this through her, through her research and so on. And that research has inf influenced the way we think about cities and so on. But I think it's, it's sort of one, it's an ongoing thing and whatever, whatever channel you can find, the better, sorry, you use it, right? To, to, to get. Do you think you were the first architect or do you know if you were the first architect in the Chamber of Commerce? No, I wasn't. There was an architect uh, probably 15, 20 years ago. I don't know what he did, but um, uh, I was trying to expand the role to have these little info sessions. So that's what um, they, they were called food for thought um, and just putting something out there that people would think about, like those stats that I was I was sharing about different yeah, aspects. For real, like the chamber that's just about business. And, you know, if there was no conversation, they're one of their biggest suppliers, sort of supporters or funders is our attract home developers, right? Who have actually now 
some of them have actually stepped or renounced their their membership because they are they understand the chamber is moving ahead and this is not the way to move the city ahead and the and chamber is happy because chamber says that we are now moving into into the real way into the 21st century in a better way right and so on and so those are like we have to speak our minds and speak what we know right in order to i mean Johanna, speak what Johanna knows in order to move move forward you got quite a bit nicer towards the end of the evening here <laughs> I think, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that is because I think sometimes students don't always understand what we might also do beyond our architecture in a box, you know. And so to be able to speak to that and affect change through business leaders or, or other leaders for that matter is really important to, to hear. So thank you. For, thank you for doing that. Yeah, I, you know what? I wish more people were, uh, more design or architecture people would run for offices. I, I really, tr uh, unfortunately, I love architecture too much to, to do that myself. But I, I remember a couple of years back, wasn't in Minnesota or Minneapolis, that there was a, there was a governor and there was a mayor. Both were at the same time. There were two architects who were running for office at the same year. And I thought that was pretty amazing. Um, so hopefully um, you can sort of, I think we can do both. I um, thank you. I have a couple other questions for you from our students. Um, and this, I think, dovetails into what you were just starting to describe. But the question is, how do you engage people unfamiliar with the design process? What are the, I'll say, what are the strategies or tactics to engage people that maybe don't have a vocabulary, perhaps, or a sensibility to begin to help them see what that value is? Well, if we start with just on the building scale, one of our best tools is model building still. Like that hasn't changed. Like we still build models in our office all the time. Um, it's something that lots of offices will say that you'll never do when you get in the work life, but we actually do. And people get into them somehow. It, it, it's funny how that doesn't, the digital world doesn't necessarily replace that. When, when a person can look at a model and kind of imagine themselves in there or be fascinated by the, by the scale of, of things, that's, you know, one immediate tool that at least with our clients we use all the time. Um, it also at this Jan Gale dinner that, uh, or lunch that Sasha was mentioning, we had just the model of the entire city. It was laying on the ground as people were arriving at the, at the luncheon and the amount of sort of sheer like Instagrams and Twitter postings, there was, there was nothing there to really look at, but just the, just the model. And people are incredibly fascinated by that. Um, so it's an access point. And then I find that, it, again, like I think you have to think about who your audience is. So if the audience is business people, you talk to them about the money. You talk to them about them, the infrastructure savings if you're building a more compact city. And you talk about how um, you can actually save $4 billion over the next 25 years out of a city budget if you were direct just the new growth within the mature city. And all of a sudden you have an audience that's listening. But I think you have to understand what makes them tick. And that sort of part psychology and, and parts is sort of knowing the context that you're operating in. I'm not what sure do you what do? I'm, you look what pretty? I'm gonna, what I'm going to add to that. Yeah, the, <laughs> I, people generally, at least when we, when we work with our clients, they want to have access to design. Right. The uh, if we can bring them into design and, you know, sometimes with more success than the others, then they feel sense of ownership over it. Right. So whether whatever the tools are. Uh, trying to get away from selling and bringing people to decision making process is great. Now you have to navigate that because that's a double edged sword. Right. Yeah. Having allowing everybody to 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 sort of influence the design process. But from our perspective, if you if you can if you can manage that, then the projects do get richer and better with clients that are actually active in the process. And then there's no, there's no buy-in. The buy-in is instant through the actual discovery of the project, project, right? So that comes, sorry, that comes with confidence uh, that we as a team can come up with something that will be worthwhile coming through this process, right? Rather than getting watered down, rather than getting lost somewhere and everybody, you know, we're trying to compromise every decision and so on. So that's, it's not straightforward and yeah, I'm not recommending it. It takes a while. But I would say back to what you started with, which was you really have to know your audience, right? You have to sort of tap into 
what are their values, what are their goals, and then maybe you don't have some of those conversations that tend to value engineer everything that you thought was important out because you're already speaking to them in the language that they, you know, want to be spoken to. Yeah, like with the private development, um, I think, I don't know if you mentioned it, but we talked about it maybe last night with, with Jennifer, is that most of those private uh, developer clients don't actually really care about design. Um, we have had some good ones recently that do, but in the beginning, certainly they didn't. What, what we realized quite quickly that if we produce the profit that they're looking for, then we get to do design stuff as long as it fits within the, within the parameters that they've, they've given us. And that's a certain amount of freedom, right? And, and, and again, there, I think you just have to realize what your responsibility is to that, that client and then realize that you also have a responsibility to the, the, the client that's not really being identified, which is the city and how that project is building part of it or what the end user is, is looking for and how you can make people's lives better. Right. And sometimes the developer may not even know what the end user really, really wants. And that's your role too, is to help them kind of see that. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, I want to just ask you about the Cherrier idea, because that kind of brings us back into a public realm, a public um, interaction. Um, did the winning project get realized? Yes. Um, so we had a jury, so we weren't picking the the winner, but so we had all the it was 750 ideas in the end. We were sort of shooting for a thousand, fell a little bit short. But the um, the the project that was picked was putting sort of sustainability messages on buses. We were trying to, or that person was trying to, the student actually who won the competition uh, was trying to really encourage public transit as a as a real alternative. Uh, we have a horrible, like we have the, I think we're the only city in North America that's or maybe in the world, whose ridership is actually like in the decline. We, if we invest less and less into that. And so they had these messages geared to kids and the kids were painting them. And so it was all sort of a community project in the end. And they got pasted on buses and they drove around the city. Do you recall how old the student was that won? She was in first year. First year, um, not, even, not even architecture. Like she was a first year university student. Somebody, just the member of a public. And I can imagine with 750 or 749 other probably good ideas, what happened to those? Anything? Is there a phase two? We, we collected them and uh, now sort of the city hall or mayor at the time has a, has a bundle of those ideas. And so we're hoping that because they're, they're almost like little guerrilla projects that maybe they'll at some point find some money. But interestingly enough, the second place winner was a person who proposed that we should open this intersection that I was talking about uh, or mentioned a, a moment ago that's currently barricaded to uh, to pedestrians. And it's a real disaster of an urban design. But anyway, and so now it was topical. It was on the election ballot and, and so on. Yeah. That's great. Um, I will, the important yeah. part is, was not necessarily the implementation. It was the actual act because it, it lasted three weeks. People were asked to write their idea in 140 characters, so we could tweet at a time. That was the limit. Uh, everybody was asked to write it on a white chair, or any chair for that matter, but white was the easiest white to write on. White sort of recognize, yeah. And then place it into public realm. And so what you would see, you would see people, groups of up to 20 people, sitting. We had these chair holders or chair minders, what are they called again? The hosts that would actually host these chairs overnight, we would place them on the like local businesses took them on, and on then they sidewalks. would they would have them on the sidewalk, and then people would read the message, and then our hope was that they would go like, "I can do better," or "That's a great idea," or advocate for that. Yeah, and talk about it. So that was again, that was the to me that was the real project. Whatever happened later, I lost interest personally. But I was interested to see. Yeah, it is two projects. Yeah, and more, and they're getting the mayor to be a poster boy. Is that what you call him? He likes taking selfies. Yeah, anyway, so they're going to get him to be a poster boy with also, again, access to City Hall, right? And so hopefully there's some more that's going to get implemented. But the real impact was getting people talking again about design. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Jen, I'm just looking at our timing. Do we want to open up to questions in the audience? Yeah, I have one question. Why don't you use that? 
Sure. Um, we have some time because I'd like to offer you all the opportunity to ask our guests uh, questions you might have at having seen their work and uh, hearing their uh, approach to uh, their different design solutions. And so any questions? Hi. Um, it's really actually great to see you guys. I actually read a <laughs> Arc Daily um, uh, column recently that you guys were selected as one of the best practices in Canada, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was more like a... Canada? <laughs> um, actually, Northern America, sorry. Um, but anyways, uh, my question was um, regarding the design activism um, and advocacy. I was thinking that it itself, uh, trying it actually could seem like a great privilege uh, to me as a um, person who's an intern at a firm that usually does a lot of uh, commercial projects and TIs, tenant improvements. So what happens is that a lot of times when we go out and design all these great facade improvements and replace all the uh, handrails, decks, and stairs, and add washers and dryers, and you know, pretty up all these apartments, the rent goes up uh, double. And um, I can't kind of avoid that kind of responsibility uh, and how it links to skyrocketing uh, rates of homelessness in this Bay Area. And I was wondering, how do you address the issues that, how do you touch on the issues that can so easily be seen like it's none of your problems? Like, um, you know, the developers, the realists, they're raising the rent, rents after the all the architectural works are done. And, you know, it can be seen like they're none of our business but we really i think should step into that and i'm not sure uh, what kind of direction that needs to be suggested into that um or what kind of conversations that needs to be made into that it is such a tough question like i i'm not sure that i'm going to provide any any solutions uh for you on that on that regard but i think general access to i think a variety of people uh into design that that is thoughtful or somebody cared about enough that it's not just sort of slapped together it is in in our case is sort of the first step is that that we have been and I think we still are quite an elitist profession in general that people can't afford to hire an architect to design their home or or they can't live in an architecture architect designed place and and I guess for us to sort of really try to do our best when what those opportunities come, because again, we don't often get to choose that. Um, but we recently had an encounter with a woman who, uh, we went to a bar um, near our home and and she got up and, and gave us a hug and we had no idea what was going on and we're sort of baffled by that. And she's like, I live in one of the, I, you designed my home. And it turns out she was in one of the social housing projects that we've done. And she was so excited and said that it's like, it's beautiful. She loves it there. And again, like just to, and I, I was like moved to tears because I thought, okay, we're, we're doing something that we don't even necessarily know that we're doing that makes an impact on people's lives. But yeah, so that was, that was a huge moment. Um, but at the same time, like, I'm not sure what to say about, uh, the gentrification and its impacts and, and how you battle that. Um, I think, of course, you can be an advocate, but I don't know that you should necessarily stop acting or feel guilty to do good design because it may then raise the price of somebody's or the, the price of somebody's home. Like, I, I don't think you can take that on, but you can certainly, act in, in trying to change that as an advocate through other other means than your, your building practice? So for us to be able to answer it, I think we need to live here for a couple of years uh, before we can even, even start to consider it. And that's, that, it's, it's a difficult thing for us to, to even come close to, to understanding it. Where we come from, well, I was always surprised about housing as in one of the richest places in the world that the U.S. is. And we still struggle with homelessness, and in the uh, and what's happening in the Bay Area, I'm we're not entirely ignorant to it, but we sort of don't understand it very well. But it looks to us from outside that the disruptors of industries have become the establishment, and the uh, they need to be disrupted now. And whether architects can disrupt that, 
that is, I think, the question we should be asking ourselves. How would you do that? And if you're able to do that, the uh, then get on and and do it right. The uh, the the high real estate prices are not the uh, not anything new. Many other cities have dealt through that, but the uh, or dealt with that. And you know, one of the best examples is Singapore, which actually guarantees housing to all, to all its citizens, and so it's all state owned and so on. And the right and the. Uh, No, 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 definitely not. But housing is not a privilege, it's a right. And I think that's one of the things that we have to understand in sort of a free market economy, that few, few things are not cannot be part of the market economy the way the housing is treated now. But is that is that does that mean you have to run for Congress or for Senate, right? It might mean so, something along those lines before you can actually get there and not, doesn't have anything to do with adding washers and dryers, right, unfortunately. Yeah, you can start more locally for sure. But again, we're not in a position to speak to that really. Your question is a is a super timely one, obviously, because we just had an election yesterday, which showed that we had at least two statewide large ballot measures to support affordable housing and encourage that through different means. Um, and then there were a variety of local measures. Some passed, some didn't pass. San Francisco, Santa Rosa, Oakland, you name it. There were at least probably seven or eight local measures. So it's obvious that that's uh, an issue that at the grassroots level, people are rising up and putting these measures, you know, on the ballots. And that's why. So it's, you can, you can advocate in the way that you were just saying, get involved in those kinds of practices too, and not feel bad about improving some other properties. <laughs> Good design. There's a city in Canada called Edmonton, you might have heard of it, it's similar to Winnipeg, and they are they have taken on NIMBYism as as sort of a force to to reckon with and fight with, and the um, they are slowly introducing the idea of, of infill and densification to their neighborhoods through design competitions, um, the forward looking design, trying to educate public that doesn't want the neighborhoods that were built, you know, 50 years or six years ago changed while they have to change if we're going to, we're going to survive over the next hundred years uh, without, with, with the with sort of infrastructure deficits and so on. Right. So that is one of the items that I know California is dealing with, which is the NIMBYism in order to permit for more housing and more affordable housing. And, you know, there's many other avenues, but that's one where design education actually may, could make a difference. Design education of broader public, right? Um, Sasha, Johanna, thank you so much for the lecture. I was I found it really inspiring, actually. Also, thank you for your uh, for illustrating how Europe uh, Europeans were killing each other for five thousand years, and then eventually learned how to live together through the European Union. Um, <laughs> I think that was quite an quite quite a display there, but um, um, kind of like a testament to the European culture in a way. But um, I'm I I I think I speak for many in our faculty that that you're you're you. You're also catering to what we believe in the 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 advocacy or the power of architecture to actually change and instigate positive change uh in that way and and I would be i think in the b arc there are there are themed studios where where we the students actually go and and advocate for change directly in the m arc it's it's quite different actually the students are building up to a thesis and the thesis then is to the personal change and we push. The ideas of, of this change, and you witness some of our students today. So I would be curious how a studio that you teach at IT or at your school, how that looks. How is that different from the, the regular design studio? I'm curious about that. Can I can I just give and then I'll give it to you, and you can do whatever you want to do with it, Mike. We have been you asked the question if we've been teaching, and we've been teaching for 15 years uh, at at our local university at Faculty of Architecture, and we've actually this is not a long story. We just met with our deans and heads and said, yes, we can keep on coming in, coming back and teach studios that we did teach for quite a few years in, the, in different capacities and so on. Three of us, three partners actually share a position. And we said, but it, it actually it's less and le has less and less impact on the city that we live in. And we would like for it to have a bit of a, not a legacy for our sake, but have an impact we're teaching there instead of just graduating students. And we're not saying just graduating students, but we are looking for a way to engage with the city. And so we are now working to develop a lab scenario, a lab uh, where we can combine our office with a uh, either an ex you know additional studio or 
try to affect urban thinking in the city through this lab and act as a connector between the policymakers, the, uh, the urban thinking that's occurring at university in our office and so on, and try to promote and propagate those ideas in the city, therefore creating, not legacy again, but creating body of work that has to do with dealing you know, with good design, good urban planning, and good, good city building. Okay. So there's that. And then... <laughs> What we have been doing, though, up until now is is doing a uh, studio, and oftentimes it's been housing, because, again, that seems to be the biggest need and, and sort of the thing that we've been toying with um, for quite a, quite a long time. But then pairing it up also with the, with the theory course that's, that's focused on sort of how you realize projects beyond the diagram and how do you develop details, technical details that have to be innovative and have to deal with the climate and so on. So the two have been kind of a pair. And then what we tend to do also is that because of the three of us have been sharing the teaching position is that we each go in and we have different opinions about stuff. And then the student has to deal with the fact is that what is their, what is their take? And it's trying to mimic the real, reality because ultimately I think what we're trying to teach students is not to get cynical and, and provide them with the tools of how to overcome it when people just say like, well, that's crap and, you know, why don't you do this instead and then hold on to what they believe in. And, and it's tough, of course, in the early years where you're still trying to develop your, your own sensibility. But I think for the older students and more mature students that are further along, at least we hear it's been very valuable from that perspective because they learn their, their own language in a way. So I have a, a question from one of the students that's uh, watching the stream, uh, Julianne Bento, and um, I'm really pleased that she asked this. Um, uh, so she says, next semester I will be taking um, ARH 450, which is the class that you saw doing the housing project first this afternoon, um, upstairs. A studio where we will be working in pairs. And the main concern for most of us in our current studio right now is how to overcome future possible disagreements. Could you please give us some tips on how to do that? No, I think it's great that you're teaching a studio uh, in pairs or have to have to have group work because I, I know our students were the same way. They're always hesitant about group work and what if they don't pull their weight and, and so on. I think one of the tips is to, um, to identify uh, your strengths. And the second tip would be to never ever settle for compromise that the best idea has to win. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. It's your authorship together when you're working as a team. And it is sort of a humbling experience. And, and I think we often talk buildings sort of into being in a way that we refuse to even put pen on paper until we sort of agree what the parameters are. We ask questions like, so what? And, and why are we doing this? And what's the sort of essence of it? What's at the core of it? Um, even in housing, we try to forget everything that we think we know to start fresh at each project and go, so what's housing about? What's this project about? Who's the client? Who's the city? And so on. And I think if you, if you tackle those kinds of questions, it's less about the authorship and you feel less precious about the, about the ideas, but you feel like you're, you're acting on behalf of the project and the task at hand. And then, of course, you're going to fight, but in the end, something good will come out, hopefully. I think this question can be taken to sort to, to to a different level. The it's interesting because Johanna and I and a couple other people have been doing group projects on our own impetus in while going through school. So we asked to do group projects in individual studios, which was the reverse of what this question was leading to. And I think to to to, but it was the understanding that the architecture is actually a team sport. And not only do you need to have the team, but you have to have a long bench in order to make a, make any project happen. It doesn't doesn't matter how small it is. Um, it it is it is necessary, and we you know relentlessness tires you out, and you need replacements. You need somebody to cover for you because you're too tired, and so on, and or, or or out of steam on a project. But the uh, in education, at least where we were educated, the um, the individual genius is still something we chase through the. Um, through education and the uh, at least the school in which that we went through, that's what's cherished, right? 
but there is actually what we think and what we discover through practice. It is actually the the genius of the group that that makes all the things happen. And sooner you embrace it, the better you're going to be off. And you know, just looking at you here. I remember when we started school, they told us out of 300 of you, there's going to be two designers, you know, 10 of you might own the firm and the rest of you are going to be, be are going to be architects, right? And architecture is such a broad profession that you have to find your place within it. And there are programs throughout the world that actually understand that, that you know, there's probably 20 or 30 roles that architects will um, find themselves and find enjoyment and find fulfillment within a any practice right and we need to understand that and the i remember sitting on sort of thesis committees and so on where students were not very strong in design but that was the only way they were evaluated on and i said she would make a great project manager one day she was my student yeah well, yeah she's not as talented as the next guy right she's not gonna her thesis is not gonna be great but she's gonna be a great project manager and we don't have a mechanism in all school in all school to recognize that and i think that's how the architectural education generally is set up and you know we've seen evidence of some of that here today but the uh and that we should not judge our colleagues or the opposite we should not judge our colleagues on on because they're they're also finding themselves right if, if things are not working out together there's a reason for it it's sometimes sheer laziness but i suspect that's not the case thank here. you um hi um so basically i've got a quick question. I was wondering, how do you try to stay relevant in a society whereby, like, social media, it's kind of like the driving force? And because sometimes I, um, as an interior architecture design student, I tend to, like, waste a lot of time trying to push the envelope or try to come up with a design that I feel like, oh, it's got to be avant-garde and stuff. So, like, what's the approach that you guys do in order to ensure that you maybe come up with a great design or is that something you think of or do you just abide to the principles of what you've been taught and then just go with the flow or like what um well it's going to be kind of a multivalent answer but i think well having sort of more people around the table so similar to the previous question uh ensures that you're not sort of falling in love with your own ideas maybe maybe at least you're more critical in a group because you can bring in various viewpoints and vet your vet your design thinking through that. Um, the, yeah, I, I think that's sort of it. But then we also are trying to always sort of find the meaning and it's it may sound hokey but um set up a hierarchy of what matters in the project oftentimes we can only afford so-called one move it doesn't mean that it's a move but but some aspect of the project that's important we try to identify that early on and then bake it into the project so that it can't be value engineered out um at the later stage when inevitably something goes wrong or the budget has to be cut or you know clients run out of money or some funding was you know raised off the off the table and and it isn't like our we think the design shouldn't rely on sort of applique or or frills and gimmicks but it should really be essential to whatever the task at hand is and so that's how we try to approach it not necessarily to to set out to do something avant-garde, but something that fits that particular thing, um, and then usually a meaningful outcome comes from that that process. So I don't know if that's helpful at all, but yeah, not always. We fail a lot, and that's important too to know and then be able to evaluate that. You know, we fail a lot when we fall out, fall in love with our ideas, and then often then in order to execute them. We tend to execute them in, in ways that are contrived, if you know what I mean, right? And the it's not easy. It should be effortless at the end. We all talk about timelessness, right? But the should feel like you haven't tried too hard, but you actually made it happen, right? And the uh, we we were recently asked to write an article about our process. It just got published today, actually. But the uh, it it sort of concludes with a statement that architecture should be should not how does it go? Should not be more nor less than it actually needs to be, and it's an impossible thing to to sort of pin down. Every project is is defined by it. I remember sitting in presentations by architects, actually from from this area, with 
that was at Mixtropoli. By the way, we should all go to Mixtropoli in Mexico City, which is one of the best conferences in the world, uh, architectural conference and cheapest architectural conferences in the world. Uh, you get three days of lectures for a hundred bucks. Anyway, the uh, the so that was one of the architects, very famous architects from these parts of the world. And the question that we asked ourselves: Do we really need to use that much re- that many resources and that much effort to create? certain emotion within people, right? And th- those are the questions we ask ourselves always. So what is the least amount of effort that the project needs to have or be invested in in order to create emotions that are important to us as, as, as architects, right? So if you can edit that down to its essence, so it's not, more, you know, it's not trying to be more than it needs to be, I think that's the right sense. But then you need, I don't, th- I don't think you can do that with a single brain, right? You need more brains to, uh, to help you with that. And if you can find partners, like our partnership is one of the one of the best things that have happened to us. Is if you can find partners with who you can you can actually share ideas quickly and be honest with. Like we we were listening to a podcast uh, with, with uh, Christopher Nolan recently, who writes his scenarios with his brother's brother most of the time. Uh, yeah, just comma comma and semicolon. And the um, and his wife is the is the editor. And she, they were working together since the since the university times, and so she's doing the editing. So he says, like they they still still look at the at the shots at the end of every day, and he says like we cut through all the crap. Like I know if she tells me something's not right, you know I know it's not right. She's gonna tell me that while somebody else who's trying to cater to your star or fame or whatever might not be doing that. So you need to find a ways to move move through your ideas quickly and edit them. So I I just. I wanted to uh, say that I think in this time, you know, you've been referring all day to the the economy, the economy of, of how a project might happen, and I think it's been a real gift to the students to think about it um, from the point of view that that uh, if something's really important, we have to figure out a way to do it, right? And I also think that when you come back to this idea of um, it shouldn't be more or less than it needs to be, I mean, that's a very sustainable idea. That we, if we, if we believe as architects that we're limited in resources, we should not, we should not lavish certain resources on something that can be utilized better for something else, and that can be our time, and that can be um, uh, the materiality that you think you have to have, but in fact, something else will will serve well, and uh, um, and so I just really appreciate the kind of consistency that comes from both the projects and and this belief that that um, you have to find it in it in its essence um, I'm going to ask a different question on behalf of someone else online um, and I think you've been in San Francisco a few times and you've been here uh, through the weekend and so the question is how would you crit- critique the San Francisco public spaces And you can be honest. How would you critique San Francisco? Like we enjoy them, right? But they're they're touristy, they're tourist oriented, right? And the uh, and I think that's the nature of any great city. Is sort of not nature, but that comes with being a great city. It is that actually you're catering to students and the you know mobility of, of middle class has become such that those pressures are sort of necessary, well, inevitable, sorry, not necessary, but inevitable in the city. Um, how would we create, I don't know, I like I like your streets. <laughs> I actually enjoy the city for what the city is, and I think wherever we travel, we enjoy the grittiness of the cities, and the uh, it's tough to, um, it's tough to tap into grittiness, always right so we we have our means of doing that but i I don't think i had a i don't even think that i have an opinion maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing about the not having an easy time with it i i don't think it references something but i i think we're you know you have several projects that reference public space and the improvement or there's an intention, you know, your housing project was to create public space, which actually in a sense speaks to, that was a very different public space, right? 
well, that would be the uh, only thing that I would I would sort of comment on again. Like it's it's not evident, um, I guess, quickly because I we don't know where people live, like where sort of real people live, and whether they have access to public space that's not entirely public, but that there's a gradient um, and there's sort of a sense of ownership over something. Where you know, if you think about kids living in a city, or if you think about the life of seniors beyond. Um, they're sort of perhaps independent years where they can sort of drive around like any North American does. Um, those are the spaces or those are the sort of eras that, that concern us. And especially for, again, our city, when we reflect back on it, living in a multi-family housing is not acceptable for, for, for lifelong, um, thing. And neither of us have never ever lived in a house. So that's fairly unusual for, for a North American. Um, but very common again back in back in Europe, and and I think what enables that is the is the sort of adequate attention to public space that extends your your daily life to the to the shared space, and it's the sandbox, and it's 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 the generations that get to act together. Then, uh, you know, your seniors are watching the kids play in the sandbox, and the kids are more independent because of that. They don't have to constantly be sort of watched over by by their parents and this, so there's le less helicoptering around, I guess. Uh, the other thing I would say is that generally just building tall, um, in North American cities maybe creates less of a good, uh, street space. Um, you know, one of the densest cities in the world is Paris. Uh, no buildings are taller than six to eight stories really, um, with, with the odd exception. Um, and, it's because of the density um, or the, the distance that's required between taller buildings. And, and when we think about human scale, when we think about connection to ground plane, that's, that's much more possible um, without tall buildings. And, and somehow, again, I, that's cultural, but it's a network of public spaces, how they connect together, different levels of privacy and publicness in them. Thank you. I think that's very helpful, particularly for students to that are working on projects that, uh, whether they're housing or multi-use, that these la that these layers um, should be recognized early on. Is there anyone else who has any questions? This is going to be a little hard to put into words for me, but um, I'm very entertained with the fact that you guys are in a city that is slowly developing and, and you, and it seems like you're catching the, the flow of, of opportunities to create a new, um, identity to the city. And I know you always need to take into context the, the history of, of the city and also the, the new qualities that are being explored in 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 architecture all around the world but can you mention something that is outside that dual chemistry and that could improve the the quality of of, of space in, in the city that 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 seems like you guys are pretty much designing because you are a relevant uh, pair of architects in 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 your city it's not like a uh, huge city that has already uh, an established um, identity. I I'm getting that impression. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understood your question, so, but I do think that the the new frontier is is sort of in the in those kinds of cities. It's in the second cities. It's in the third cities. I hope many of you end up in those places where I think you have a you can have a bigger impact. Right, but my question is so. You take context of, of history of the city, uh, like the needs, and you also take ideas from, from other cities that have already developed. But is there something outside that, that dual chemistry, that uh, two patterns of, of development? Um, I, again, I'm hoping I'm understanding it now, but I, I think there's uniqueness. I think there's locality. I think there's something that... Um, makes us excited to be still, even though we often talk about how things are wrong in, in Winnipeg, but also how things are actually unique and how they have to be embraced. And, and every city has its character, not that it can't be improved, 
but there's something like we talked about this isolation, this weirdness, the kind of quirkiness of the of the city, and then figuring out what to do with that, how to sort of amp it up, or how to turn it into something that um, is not it's not you know Oslo or Copenhagen or whatever, um, but it's something like of a you do. Thanks. So the <laughs> we're. Uh, we're talking about, we mentioned a project that we're master planning um, in Winnipeg, and the uh, it was developed, sort of the density measures and all that was developed before we got on the project, but the uh, the test run was run on a typical Canadian development, which is a podium tower of a certain height, right? And there were five of those placed across the site to about 1,000 units, and it's you know, it is what it is. Vancouver and Toronto see one of those built today, it seems to us. And the, uh, the, so when we got onto the project, we had sort of parameters set for us. And then the, uh, so it's interesting in a little city, it's much easier to analyze things. So we realized that there's probably two developers in the city that would be able to take on one of these towers. Sort of, that's sort of the nature of the city. And maybe three different contractors that could actually build them. And the and the absorption rate when you think about cities that are slow growing are is pretty low. So okay, so we build a tower that has you know two hundred units in it. It's gonna take several years to sell. These projects are very slow, only few will benefit from them, and we have to actually fit in the in the business um ideas of people that actually can build it. So we we approached our client and said the the appropriate way to build in Winnipeg is to try to open this up and democratize it, to open it up to contractors that know how to build buildings up to six stories and developers. There are plenty of, there are plenty of that can actually build buildings, you know, 40 units per building, six story tall and so on. And so we've modified the entire master plan to be up to six story buildings, got a call, got hundred responses to it, right? Pick the ones that we wanted to work with, pick the ones that are most forward looking, and actually we're now executing eleven buildings as opposed to, and that was the understanding of what our context was. Yes, we looked up or the previous uh, architects looked at looked up to other cities, but tried to import things that actually wouldn't work in our city or wouldn't work as well and so that's that's where understanding comes in so the yes, you have to understand the context if you wish historical if you're if you're saying you have to understand what forces there are or what opportunities there are by studying other places, but it still has to be appropriate somehow to the context that you're doing and it doesn't need to that doesn't need to mean it has to be compromised or has to be beige right or can't stand out or whatever but the it, you have to understand exactly where the value is yeah <laughs> through an example case study. Any other any other questions? Okay, I had one quick. I, I think maybe a quick last question, and that was just if you can share uh, any ideas that you are currently exploring um, to encourage the public uh, to engage in design. Maybe another lose your shirt project. I don't know. Maybe not. Is there anything on the boards in that regard? So if she takes two days off, she becomes restless, and then the uh, then I get a call at, at 3 a.m. says, we're going to do this. I'm like, no. And then No, I don't, I don't have that kind of a project, but uh, as I was mentioning, it's still in the middle of, of selling this policy document that they've developed for how the city should grow. Um, so have a meeting on November 30th at the city hall to try to convince them that um, they just came up with a plan where they're they're building more of the fringe, like we're sprawling further. This is where they're developing land. And now we're trying to reverse that and convince the new city councilor that was just elected to actually look at the economic benefits of it. So I'm, we're not fully through. And I think part of the issue is that our city is running away that every councilor that's elected is elected by a ward. Those are all over the city. Nobody really looks after the interests of the city as a whole. So... I'm sorry, it's a kind of a boring answer, but it's a policy-based, that's the current project, is to try to affect the policy of how we how we grow over the next 25 years. I'm so personally hoping that this lab that we're talking about is going to be the next money money loser and lose your shirt project uh, where we, we're hoping we can actually, because only then we can actually influence people if you're not precious about how it actually func functions financially, and then tapping into the energy of university and faculty and so on. So that, that is my hope. 
Sounds like a good plan. Okay, I think with that, I would like to thank our esteemed guest and all of you for joining us this evening. It's been a great conversation. Thank you both. Thanks for the endurance. <laughs>